All right, folks, we keep hearing about right wing populism and I will keep warning people about it because right wing parties internationally are the best positioned right now. The left has been defeated. Uh, this wave that started, I think, arguably with Syriza and went through Corbyn to Sanders has obviously lost. Doesn't mean that there isn't other openings. It doesn't mean there isn't other things to do, but we need to be real. It's lost. This sort of 2013 to 2020 period has ended in defeat and the left has to reformulate itself. Center, Democratic uh, Party, Social Democratic Party is the Labor Party. Not only do they not have the policy set to meet the crisis of the moment, but they've shown themselves as in those abominable leaks from the Labour Party in the UK, which show specifically that paid professional employees, paid employees of the Labour Party in senior strategy positions were actively undermining and rooting for a defeat in 2017. And of course, that was an election that Corbyn came just shy of a couple of thousand votes of actually winning. And you can imagine a Corbyn Labour government, how many lives would have been saved uh, just in the corona crisis alone. So we're in this moment and very pernicious, dangerous political actors across the globe are in power. Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban, Modi, we got the usual list. And I think the way they're pitching populism really fluctuates from place to place. I think that some of these places do a mix of vicious xenophobia uh, and narrow nationalism with some actual economic delivery. That's the most dangerous formulation. In the United States, we keep getting these promises from Trump and from Bannon and from others around that side of the of politics that the right-wing populism is going to happen here. Even as the main domestic policy initiative that the Trump administration has done and signed into law was a massive giveaway for the rich in 2017. That's the biggest thing they did. And the other main effort of their focus uh, was, of course, to try to destroy Obamacare. Now, obviously, Obamacare, we need Medicare for all. This is not a defense of Obamacare. But if that relative debate was not an improvement or a replacing of Obamacare with something better. That was a all-hands-on-deck effort to get 20 million people off of health insurance. The bailout is a giant, giant corporate redistribution of wealth and assault on small businesses. So where is the populism here? It's a scam. It's bullshit. It doesn't exist in the Trump administration. And for every, you know, sort of pocket of line you hear from a media entrepreneur or policy put forward by a Josh Hawley, watch him, very important, very dangerous figure the most significant emerging national Republican politician who has put forward some legislation on things like securing the supply chain, which is only going to get bigger as a policy issue. In Japan, companies are getting significant credits to move production back domestically for strategically vital industries. That's going to be a major area of policy focus and opportunity uh, for the right, which the left should not cede. But in the main, this right-wing populism thing is BS in the United States from an economics perspective. It's certainly not BS when it comes to vicious xenophobic terrorism of migrant and refugee communities. We see that day in and day out from this administration. And I want to distill how big a lie this is by watching Steve Mnuchin okay, talk about the woefully and pathetically insufficient relief checks that Americans are getting. Now others, Bernie Sanders, Rashida Tlaib, Ro Khanna, uh, and others are pushing to get people $2,000 a month for the duration of the crisis. That's a bare minimum of what's necessary. And that's of course actual populism and the only people moving in that direction are the progressive sectors of the Democratic Party. This is what Steve Mnuchin had to say about you surviving, paying your rent, buying groceries, not having a job, on 1200 bucks. Three, as you said, there'll be these, these checks in the mail or direct deposit. It's really bridge liquidity for people as they go through these difficult times. Bridge liquidity for about eight weeks? 
Well, I, I think the entire package provides economic relief overall for about 10 weeks. Uh, hopefully we'll kill this virus quicker and, and we won't need it. But uh, we, we have liquidity to put into the American economy to support American workers and American business. So, so OK, first of all, the distribution of wealth to corporations in, the, in, in tax write offs, benefits, the trillion dollar slush fund with no oversight to the Treasury. This is going to reset the economy for decades. And of course, this was a, you know, just the the CARES Act is a travesty and everybody bears responsibility uh, for it. But the reality is, is that in addition to um, the fact that this is not going to last, the virus will literally not be killed in three months. This is going to last longer. We know that there is not a single part of the United States, let alone major American cities, but forget it. You want to say, oh, well, you know, sure, San Francisco, New York, these are unusually expensive places to live, so we can punish working and poor people who work who live there even more. This will not get you by in rural Minnesota for eight weeks. This won't get you by in eastern or in western Massachusetts. This won't get you by in Maine. Okay. This is not enough money for anybody with a family or anybody supporting anybody, and in most cases, simply taking care of a single individual. So, you know, it's strong, obviously, let them eat cake energy. Jamie, I am me that this, you know, at least Marie Antoinette was fun to look at. I don't know if she was, I guess it's historical uh, conjecture, but certainly, well, as Bill Maher said, Steve Mnuchin looks like what all strippers think all men look like. But the substantive point here, is that for every thought piece and for every argument that you will see over the next several months, that there is a realignment in the parties and that there is this populist wave in the Republican Party, remember Mnuchin's statement. And remember that he has actual power in the administration. Where the right wing has power in the administration, the so-called populist right, is in presiding over a vicious assault on those seeking asylum. That's where there's some actual power. When it comes to the discourse of we're Republicans, but we should raise taxes on the rich, we should seriously protect small businesses, we should do actual infrastructure plans, this has never happened. And it's not going to happen. So even as the critique of where the Democrats are at and their leadership is completely valid and 100% right, and as people know, I, I just simply don't buy the idea that there has been any structural change in the core policy base of the leadership of the Democratic Party. Maybe some, as President Obama would say, nibbles around the edges, but nothing structural. Conversely, don't fall for the opposite BS and hype. This is the Republican Party. The Republican Party is a scumbag from Goldman Sachs who grew up rich, who should have, who should have been prosecuted by Kamala Harris in California, saying that Americans can live for three months, eight weeks, two or three months off of $1,200. It is pure oligarchy. Not to mention the part of the, of the airline bailout that he's presiding over that could still shed a million jobs in the airline industry. So don't fall for the hype and the lies. There is no right-wing populism with regards to economic delivery. That's, that is the most relevant clip uh, of anything from the modern Republican Party. It's it, very important to see what Holly's doing. It's interesting. It's important to see what Bannon is positioning. Trump has some of these instincts, but this is what's actually happening. If I, this is what they're doing. Sorry. If I put myself back in Fargo mindset, that that's still like ridiculously out of touch. No, yeah, no, no. Where does could that you do sense? that in Fargo? No. Could you do that in Fargo? Not. I mean, that maybe not. you could pay your rent in a, in a smaller place. I think probably rent's gone up since I live there. Um, but yeah, tw- for, for what did he say? 10, 12 weeks or whatever. Yeah. I mean, not even close. Yeah. Not even not considering even the fact that your this check can be garnished by, you know, uh, people who owe debt to their banks or to credit card companies. Oh, right. Nice, lovely. Yeah. right. No, that's exactly right. This is a really important point. This was, this was something that was just reported that 
you can that that yes that your creditor or your bank can still garnish your wages can garnish your stimulus check and of course as the head of as a as a fed official just said i believe yesterday banks can still keep paying off uh you know their folks uh you know on on boards and so on and you know he said i don't see why this would threaten why what's happening now would question our capitalist system yeah. i guess other than the fact that all private <laughs> sector activity needs a massive infusion of government effort. Well, it's like we had this $2 trillion stimulus, right? There are 130 million workers uh, in the US. That's $15,000 per worker, over 15,000. So where did the rest of that money go? And what's that being used for? Right. I think for the second week in a row too, we've seen, uh, you know, millions and millions of people losing work and filing for unemployment and stocks, uh, you know, that continuing to climb. So obviously we have a very healthy system right now that is functioning exactly perfect. And also in New York, as an example, the despicable Andrew Cuomo, there was no, there was, uh, people can't even get their own employment benefits in many cases. You have reports across the country and particularly in New York, people calling the unemployment office, literally there was a report in the cut, a woman said that on one day she called them over 250 times. So this is the dynamic. And yes, I mean, the idea of like a mass investor capitalism, this is really laying it out very clearly. Wall Street can climb back. And of course it will climb back because this is a next level of consolidation oh, yeah. uh, and wealth redistribution to the top in the American economy. And it is a structural failure of the system and it is absolutely a product of leadership in both parties. But I actually, I think that more and more folks are getting honest and real about the nature of the Democratic Party. Don't substitute that, that for a fantasy about the Trump administration or the Republican Party. They're the drivers and engines of this. And Steve Mnuchin is essential. So when you think about all this right-wing populist nonsense, yeah, certainly you could think about the torture and kidnap of children, which is an animating force of this administration. But... When you hear something about, no, we're going to rethink the market. Remember Steve Mnuchin and his wife standing in front of the money press yeah. and then listen to him tell you that you can live off of $1,200 for months. It's I, disgusting. I mean, the idea that after the corporate tax cut and then or the, the, the Trump tax cuts and then this big corporate bailout that we're going to trust the markets, like the markets are completely spoiled. It's, it's like, uh, yeah. And these people have been fighting to slash food stamps, which is just an act of pure cruelty that will increase child hunger and, you know, force and basically terrorize millions of people's basic nutrition needs. I don't see the populism there. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, again, let's be real. Let's not be fools. All right, guys, we're going to take a brief break and then we're going to come back with Gene Bajlan. We're going to talk about how Corona is impacting the Middle East.
Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here joining us now. Gene Bajalon, professor of Missouri State University. Gene, greetings. How are you? How is everyone? I'm doing good. Uh, we're just all here on lockdown in Missouri, you know, trying to stay safe, trying to teach by distance, you know, following the news, following the guidelines and, you know, keeping up with the family in Britain. My brother and his wife are both nurses in the NHS, so I want to give them a shout out for all the hard work they're doing at the moment. It's a difficult time, especially in Britain. Uh, but, you know, uh, things in Missouri are shut down. Uh, there are still people going out with their uh, Trump signs uh, complaining that this is all a uh, Chinese hoax. But, uh, you know, most people seem to be taking it quite seriously, which, which is a good thing. Gene, let's talk about how this is affecting the Middle East and the, maybe even more broadly the MENA region. And also this, you know, Let's start with the with the top line. I've talked about this before. The U.S. sanctions campaign against Iran has already had an enormously negative humanitarian consequence, even pre-corona. It has been amped up and continued. People like Mon Mike Pompeo in power, but also uh, sort of you know disgusting pundits like an Eli Lake have seen this as an opportunity. Uh, for regime, uh, for you know the never-ending quest for war or regime change with Iran, can you let's just start? We'll, we'll talk more broadly about Turkey and Iraq and all the other dynamics. But what is the state of specifically the sanctions war and the enormous humanitarian toll on Iran and those who see this as an opportunity uh, to push forward a, a, a U.S. Uh, a, a regime change agenda? Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we look at the impact of Corona on Iran in, in a general sense, Iran was a country that was affected very early by Corona, hit pretty hard by Corona. And of course, you know, we can look at the internal dynamics of Iran that have helped exacerbate this. However, if we, you know, take a look at the international uh, situation, we can see, you know, that sanctions on Iran have made things very difficult for the Iranian government, whatever their flaws are, to purchase and acquire the equipment necessary to deal with uh, with this crisis as it gets out of control. Um, so there's a little bit of double talk taking place from the U.S. administration about the sanctions. So they say, well, you know, uh, medical supplies are not under sanctions, you know, Iran can import medical supplies, and they blame the Iranian regime saying, well, you know, they're spending all this money on proxies abroad when they should be spending it uh, at, uh, at home, uh, which is ironic because, you know, that's a criticism we could talk about the United States spending its resources on foreign wars rather than spending it on uh, health care for its population. But the truth is, you know, even if the sanctions are, uh, uh, don't include medical supplies, how are they going to purchase it? If you're a bank and you want to do business with Iran and the Iran wants to transfer money to purchase these goods, this is a risky situation. So there are a whole load of sort of things which are not directly related to the purchase of uh, procurement of medical supplies, which make it difficult for Iran to purchase uh, the th supplies that they need. So basically what, we're, what we see is, you know, if uh, Iran can't transfer the money it needs, um, business 